When someone begins to question their faith, the last thing church leaders want to do is say the wrong thing or handle it in a way that will further push them away. With so many historical concerns or doctrinal questions, what is a leader supposed to do? I'm happy to report that Leading Saints is here to help with the Questioning Saints Library. This is a full library of 20 plus presentations related to how to minister to an individual who is questioning their faith. We cover topics like how to answer tough questions, maintaining relationships when someone leaves the church, and how to embrace doctrinal ambiguity. If you want to review all the sessions from the Questioning Saints Library at no cost for 14 days, simply go to leadingsaints.org 14. That's leadingsaints.org 14. While you're at it, we'll give you access to all of our virtual libraries that cover several leadership-related topics. So click the link in the show notes or simply visit leadingsaints.org slash 14. Today I'm in Provo, Utah with uh, Brother Russell Oscarthorpe. How are you? Very well. How about you? Good. We were just sort of joking about your last name, that it only took the church five years of, of you as, as Sunday School General President for That's us to right. nail it. Right? I, I'm still surprised when they can pronounce it correctly. <laughs> what's what's the background of that name? Where, where's it? It's from? all British. Wow. So, yeah, my ancestors came from England and as far back as we can go, Osgothorpe is English. There's even a little town called Osgothorpe, England. Yeah. Yeah. Very small town. Interesting. And you've yeah. been spelling it to, to doctor's offices and dentists your, your whole life, right? We, we spell it every day. <laughs> People always say, thank you for spelling your name. And I say, oh, we're, we're used to spelling. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I yeah. bet. Now, obviously, m- most people know and are familiar with you, with your work in the General Sunday School Presidency. Maybe just take us back to that moment. Like, how did that calling come to be? Is there a story behind that? Well, it certainly came out of the blue for me. I was in my office and at BYU, and I got a call from the Office of the First Presidency saying or asking me if I could come and meet with President Monson at 2 p.m. on that, I think it was a Thursday. That same day? No. Oh, okay. It was, yeah, it? it was like the next day or whatever. Gotcha. Two days later, I can't remember. And so I said, well, yes, I can come meet with <laughs> President Monson. Yeah. So I walked into his office, and when I crossed the threshold, just after opening the door, he looked at me and he said, hmm, broad shoulders, that is very good. <laughs> It's kind of like we're going, to, you up, huh? we're going to put some things on those shoulders. So I'm uh-huh. glad you've got shoulders we can put things on. And he was like that the whole time. Just absolutely down to earth, enjoyable, joking with me, having a lot of fun actually in the interview. Hmm. And Elder Nelson at the time, Russell M. Nelson, was the managing director of the priesthood department, which was called the priesthood department at that time. Mm-hmm. Now it's called priesthood and family department. And so he was there and President Monson. So both of them. And it was President Nelson who eventually set me apart. President Monson asked him to set me apart after he, one of his counselors had set apart my other counselors. Hmm. And he asked President Nelson to set me apart. So really? Yeah. And so your counselors are set apart before you? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, wow. And then I was set apart as the president. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, so walking into that calling, like uh, I'm always intrigued by these positions, these, you know, general positions that have counselors that you can pick from anybody in the world to be your counselors. uh, That's right. You know, in theory, right? So what was the process of choosing counselors like? Well, it's not easy because, again, the field is so white already to harvest. (laughs) I bet. There are so many people who would be magnificent. And you come up with possibilities, and you discuss those possibilities with the brethren, and the brethren sometimes give counsel back and suggestions, and then you go about the process of inspiration and being inspired as to who ought to be your counselors. So it was a good process. I had been through it other times, and this was a a very good process with a lot of counsel and a lot of divine help. Yeah. And walking into that position, I mean, where do you even begin? I mean, I, I would expect some revelation came and some direction from heaven, well, but what yeah. did you hope to accomplish on day one? Well, right after I got called, President Monson said, he said, look, he looked at Elder Nelson. He said, now, Elder Nelson will now take you up to his office and introduce you and kind of orient you to the calling. 
we sat down in Elder Nelson's office, and Elder Nelson said, Brother Osgathorpe, you have been called to improve learning and teaching in the entire church. <laughs> and the broad shoulders again, right? <laughs> and I felt like saying, could you rephrase that <laughs> so that it's a little more doable? Uh, that sounds just a little daunting, to say the least. And then he explained the priesthood and family department, which is called now, and all of their functions. And it was interesting because he said, here's the way to look at it. He said, we've got the missionary department, and they obviously handle missionary work. We have the temple department, they handle temple work. And the priesthood and family department handles everything else in the church. <laughs> and that's why wow. all of the general officers are in the priesthood and family department, the mm -hmm. primary, the Sunday school, the young men, the young women, the Relief Society. Everybody is connected to the priesthood and family department because all the curriculum, all the meetings that are held, is, in other words, that department affects every single member of the church. The other departments have more emphasis, for example, the missionary department, more emphasis on young people and senior missionaries. And the temple department has more emphasis on all that goes with temples. And so they're not dealing with little children and that kind of thing. So, but priesthood and family, everything, the whole family, the whole body of the church. And so that's one reason that it's an exciting place to be and to try and contribute because you know you're contributing. It was like, come follow me. Look, look what come follow me has done yeah. over the past few years. And that's what I spent all of my time on when I was Sunday school general president was come follow me. Yeah. And I guess one thing I mentioned, like how, do, how would you articulate sort of your professional background that you brought to that calling as, as a Sunday school president? I might say it was very handy. Yeah. <laughs> because my whole life I've been thinking about how can we help people learn better? How can we help them improve their ability to learn not just the gospel, but everything that they are learning? And so that's my profession. My yeah. profession is improving learning and teaching. So then when I got to the church, compared, I mean, I probably shouldn't do this, but I compared it a little bit to Mac Wilbur. He had been doing music all of his life, right. and then he yeah. became the director of the time I would choir. I've been doing learning and teaching all my life, and then I became the president of the Sunday school. And they said, in a sense, they were really saying to me, the brethren were really saying, we want you to use what you know, you know, about learning and teaching from your profession. We don't want you to rely on that particularly, you know, only, obviously, because it has to be, it has to come from heaven. Right. But it's like when the brethren say a lot of, you know, get all the information you can so that you can have inspiration more information brings more inspiration. Yeah. And so I always like the example of President Nelson when that story that he tells when he was a young surgeon and the patriarch came to him and said, I want you to operate on me. And he said, you know, we can't fix, you've got one valve we can fix, but the other valve we cannot fix. There's no remedy for that that I can think of. And he said, I'm going to pray about it and I want you to pray about it and I want you to operate on it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And President Nelson finally did operate on him. In the middle of the operation, all of a sudden, in his mind, he saw what needed to happen to that other valve, which procedure had never been done to his knowledge by anyone else on a valve like that ever. And I look at that example and I say, okay, that was obviously, you know, President Nelson said it was an answer to prayer. And I say, yes, it was an answer to prayer, but I could have prayed from now until forever. And I would never have seen what needed to happen to that valve in my mind because I wasn't prepared from a professional standpoint. He had spent his life looking at heart surgery. And so then he was ready to receive yeah. what came. So I think that's the way it works with most of us. Everybody brings a different gift. I, I used to say to people, why do you think President Oaks has had so much influence on handbook writing? Oftentimes he has been the chair of the handbook revision mm. committee. And yeah, we don't realize those things are happening a lot. Right. right. Yeah. But it's because he has that expertise. He brought it with him professionally. And so the Lord, in a sense, has something to work with. Yeah, exactly. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. And he'll work with it. For and sure. He'll work with it. Yeah. He will, he will inspire people to do what they need to do, but we need to do what we should do before to learn all we can about whatever gift the Lord might give us 
we need to do all we can to expand upon that so that he has something to work with. Yeah. And so it was the majority of your career like at BYU in uh, teaching or, or researching around this, this stuff? Or how would you right. specifically uh-huh. describe your career that led to this? Yeah. Well, I started out my career at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf in New York. So I was there for four years as a oh, wow. faculty member working with deaf college students. And so I was trying to help them get the most that they could out of, we call them cross-registered classes. In other words, you've got a deaf person sitting next to a class, you know, classmates of all hearing mm-hmm. students. And so how could we help them succeed in that environment? And so we kind of developed support services for them to improve their learning. So that's how I kind of got started with my career. And then I came back to BYU and I did all kinds of things actually at BYU. I did a lot with special education, uh, trying to help them improve their learning and with teacher education. And I kind of had to follow what my research followed what I needed to learn at the time. And that's really, in a sense, what happened with this book yeah. you know, that we're talking about. I, I like to write to learn myself. In other words, if I have to write something, then that means I'm really going to have to get an understanding of it. And so when something puzzles me and perplexes me, I look at it and I say, okay, what could I investigate? What could I do research on that is going to help me learn what I need to learn? And then once I do, it might be that I could help somebody else learn that as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. So, and I'm and I'm intrigued by this concept of like, you know, bringing this background to this position, you can almost fall back on your experience as a crutch and, and maybe in, unintentionally dismiss seeking higher revelation. And, and, and I'm sure that mm-hmm. was part of it. But anything you did to intentionally make sure that you weren't just relying on that educational background with all the decisions you made? Because it seems like a lot of these like, oh, well, I've seen this before. Let's just do it this right. way. And I think what happened there is the process of counseling. Hmm. So. Elder Piper, Paul Piper, used to explain, people would say, oh, you did come follow me. And he'd say, he would say, well, we each put our grain of sand on the table. Right, yeah. And then it developed into come follow me. We each contributed our piece. And the people sitting around the table did not have the professional background I did. In fact, a lot of the time, I felt like they were relying too much on my professional background mm. and not enough on their own inspiration at times. So I, I felt like saying, hey, don't, don't expect me to have all the answers here. This is something that needs to come from God, and we need to do all we can to rely on Him and His help as we go through this. And, but as everyone counseled around the table, coming from very different backgrounds, Somebody might be, you know, I mean, someone was like Elder Craig Christensen was in the car business. I mean, yeah. and so he came at it from a different standpoint than someone else who perhaps was an attorney or whatever background they had. And so I never really felt through the whole process of Come Follow Me that I had to squelch my professional background and make sure I didn't rely on it too much. I, yeah. I kind of drew everything I could from it. And then, but that wasn't enough because my professional background is not about just about gospel learning. Gospel learning is unique. It is very unique. And it's like in one council meeting we had with all the Area 70s. I was in Area 70 at the time, but it was just before I was called as Sunday School General President. And Elder Bednar was speaking and he said, Brothers and he said, brother, this is what teaching and learning is all about in the church. And he went into this and I said, oh, that's what I need. That's my answer. Hmm. And so I quoted him in my first talk. And yeah. <laughs> it was like, thank you, Elder Bednar. Yeah. This is, he didn't get that from his professional background. That He's talking about gospel learning, which is very unique, where we bear testimony, where we invite people to live a new principle, where we have doctrine. Well, that doesn't come from a professional background. You don't talk about doctrine and testimony. Yeah. No, you don't talk about those things. But there are corollaries, you know, in your in learning research that can help with all of that and say, well, how do we give an effective invitation? How we do how do we ask a good question in gospel learning? And how can we bear testimony throughout the time that we teach so that people are uplifted and edified? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. And and it, it sort of gives us a peek into the, you know, behind the scenes as far as how a program like Come Follow Me comes to the surface. It's not like you walked in there and it's like, all right, guys, this is what we're doing. That's I right. got, I've been holding this file for, for years <laughs> waiting for this opportunity. But it's like, every, like you said, everyone puts their grain of sand on the table and uh, little by little, inspiration comes to the surface, right? Exactly. Nor, nor did President Monson or President Nelson come down and say, here's the revelation I got last night. Make it like this, right? They almost never do. Yeah. In other words, they know what is good when they see it, but they don't tell you what to do to get there precisely. They kind of wait for you to present something that feels right and uh, looks right. And then in council again, because we presented multiple times with the Council of the Twelve and, and also the First Presidency. And so they all have to feel that it's right. And they know that it's right when they see what is happening is coming from the Lord. Yeah. It's almost as if they're sort of approving the process, not necessarily where the period is or, That's or right. how the paragraphs are lined up. That's right. right. They're not, yeah. not concerned about minute details. They're, they're concerned about the general direction. It was like in one meeting, I remember Elder Ballard said, Brother Osgothorpe, what about the seminary? Are you going to coordinate with the seminary? We've never coordinated the curriculum with the seminary before, ever. And so we said, okay. So we brought Brother Paul Johnson in, and we started talking about how to correlate what we were doing with what they were doing, and first time ever in the church. Wow. And it's a, a huge blessing right now. I mean, I think it's helping a lot of youth. It's amazing. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I got a few like wormholes I want to jump down and this is, uh, I always get in this mode, but they're fun to explore. You know, when it comes to teaching from a leadership standpoint, I see this model and I went through the same model as a bishop and, and whatnot where, you know, I have certain appointments and this problem surfaces and I think, okay, there's this problem, whatever it is, maybe there's been an extra amount of levels of confession around pornography or ministering isn't getting done. Like, here's this problem, right? And we uh, maybe we take it into ward council and we talk about it. And finally, it gets to a point saying, okay, there's this problem. We need to address this problem. And so, let's get everybody in a room, all right? So, we have maybe a fifth Sunday or give a special sacrament talk. Everybody's in a room. I'm going to talk at you for 40 minutes or whatever. And so, this problem goes away, right? And then what happens is everybody listens, yeah, and maybe they're a little distracted. Then the problem doesn't go away. And we think, Maybe I need to talk at him more. So let's get another, you know, you, know, you sort of get in this, uh, this rat race of a trap of like, I'm telling them the problem. I'm telling them how to solve the problem, but the problem's not being solved. So this component of not just teaching, but like trying to motivate and influence while teaching is a daunting problem that a lot of leaders deal with. Any thoughts come to mind? I don't know this question is from left field, but I'm curious. No, that's a great, that's a really great question. And yeah, I've thought about this a lot myself. Oh, good, good. And so... Even in Come Follow Me, when we developed it, one of the articles that I wrote during that time, I called it, the lesson is inside the learner. If we think the lesson is inside the manual, mm. we're in trouble. If we think the lesson is inside some group of people that got together and talked about what this problem was, and we've got to address it, and we've got to tell people how to fix it, that's a problem too. The lesson is actually inside the learner. And our job when we teach is to help unlock that. I'm just writing a little piece called, We Need to Unclamp Our Brain. <laughs> nice. <laughs> this came from William James. He said, we need to unclamp our brain and let it run free and imagine. I say, well, we need to imagine, all right, but the imagination needs to be grounded, needs to be moral imagination, needs to be tied to God. And when we do that, now look what happens. We can imagine our way out of this, but each individual has to engage in that process of moral imagination themselves. They mm -hmm. all need to do it themselves. And so our role as leaders is to help them, as you say, motivate them, invite them, inspire them to look inside themselves and say, okay, now, wait a minute. How does this relate to me specifically? What do I need to do? And in some cases, what the person up they're preaching or teaching or lecturing is doing is spraying this general thing out there that maybe no one in the audience relates to very well. Mm -hmm. And so they say, well, this doesn't apply to me. I don't need to do anything with this. Yeah. And, and the leader is saying, you all need to do something. You're right. <laughs> no, believe me, I, you do. Believe me, you need to do something with this. And in actuality, the only way that that can happen is if they get their own inspiration from the Holy Ghost to say, this is what I need to do regarding this principle of the gospel. 
whether it be tithing or pornography or whatever it is. It's kind of like, this is what applies to me, and this is now what I need to do. And they can get ideas from the leader and inspiration from the leader, but not, in a sense, direction. Not, we don't want to kind of impose ourselves. And, and Elder Bednar is the best one for this. He said yeah. that a teacher can act upon a student. We don't want that. We don't want teachers acting on students. We don't want to be acted upon. We want to act. And that means in order for us to act, the desire has to come inside us, and we have to then sort it out. What do I need to do? And ask the Lord, what do I need to do specifically to kind of make progress along the covenant path with this particular principle? Yeah. And I think the scary thing for a leader about this concept of, you know, the lesson in the learner is that sometimes that lesson wasn't the lesson that we had for them, right? Like you said, act. Right. I wanted to act upon them with this lesson. Like temple tennis needs to improve, folks. Like that's that's what I'm bringing you here today, right? But someone may draw upon certain doctrines and they're inspired or directed or that lesson leads them maybe not necessarily going to the temple double amount of time in a month, right? And, and so it can be frustrating when we sort of bring our agenda to that dynamic as a leader of saying, I'm trying to influence you and, and it almost manipulate you to do something. Right. Right. And, and even if we say we want to motivate people to go to the temple more, we want to do this. And this is a great example because the other day, well, not too long ago, in, in church, I said to the elders corn president, I said, do you think it might be helpful if I demonstrate using media how to make a temple appointment? We have a ward with a lot of older people. And I was very convinced that we have people not going to, not because they don't desire to go to the temple. Right. They don't know how to get that appointment. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so he said, okay, let's do this. Let's teach each, each other that, you know, because I ask, how many need help with this? Quite a few needed help with it. Well, so think what a waste of time it is for somebody to say, you really ought to want to go to the temple. You yeah. know, I, and he said, well, I want to go to the temple. Yeah, yeah. I, I just can't work this computer to make it do what I need it to do. Uh -huh. So that's how we can miss it as a leader. We can kind of miss the, the, the hook, miss the point, miss the invitation that we need to give, because we're not thinking of the needs of the learner so much, and also the gifts of the learners. What we ought to be thinking about is, how can I help magnify these gifts in the ones I lead? Mm. We always think of, well, you know, they all got these needs, they got these problems, we got to solve their problems and, and meet their needs. And you say, well, what about the gifts? Because they are, they're full of gifts. All these people have so many gifts. Some of them are invisible. They're not really transparent gifts at all. And we need to discover those gifts as leaders and say, let's, you've got this gift. Let's help you magnify that gift. And then Zion can happen, basically. Yeah. That's how Zion happens, by yeah. magnifying gifts. I'm also curious about this concept of, of teaching doctrine, right? Like this is something yeah. that we hold very sacred. It's in our yeah. tradition. And sometimes I feel like it gets missed or misunderstood. For example, maybe a leader thinks, yes, I need to teach doctrine, and I'm speaking in a ward conference, and temples are in our doctrine, and so I'm going to teach that people need to go to the temple. And before we know it, we're teaching an application of, well, I go to the temple, and it blesses my life, so you should go to the temple, uh -huh. and, and I go every other week, and maybe you should consider upping your... And, yeah. and we, we fall into this mode of teaching an application and miss the, the doctrine. So if someone was to ask you, like, how do you teach doctrine? Rather than applications, how do you, how would you respond? When we were doing Come Follow Me, I used to love to go to a, a ward and just watch people coming out of a Sunday school class because it's called Gospel Doctrine. doctrine. <laughs> and I would say, what was the doctrine you learned today? And they said, the doctrine? Let me see. Well, we talked about John the Baptist. Well, it must have, I mean, it must have been baptism. I don't know. We didn't really <laughs> talk about baptism that much. I, and then they'd go on and on. And no, they can't name the doctrine. Mm -hmm. We used to joke as a presidency, we said, we got gospel doctrine without any doctrine. <laughs> Just gospel. <laughs> Just people talking about things. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And so when we can ground ourselves in the doctrine, and it's fun to do this with youth, you know, what doctrine, do, you'll notice Come Follow Me with youth really focused on doctrines. We're going to talk about the doctrine of the family. We're going to talk about the plan of salvation. We're, you know, all these doctrines one month at a time. And for me, it was kind of like, for the first time, I could go and ask a youth, well, what doctrine did you, t we talked about the plan of salvation, and, the, and sometimes you call it a plan of happiness, and this is what, we, 
this is why it means so much to me now, more than it meant before we talked about it. That is really strong. I think we have a long ways to go yet in the church before we kind of remind ourselves to settle on doctrine. When I was Sunday school president, we walked in the curriculum room and we saw this diagram of all the doctrines and principles laid out on this enormous wall with, I mean, it's like 112 or something. Yeah. <laughs> Different doctor. I can't remember. I said that. I said, that's not help. <laughs> Can we summarize it a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Could we boil this down yeah. a little bit? And so the seminary was trying to do the same thing. You know, let, let, let's teach basic doctrines of the church so that we can ground people and get them a strong foundation. And so that, I think, is what always ought to be in the back of our mind. And what are we learning when we're preparing to teach gospel doctrine or, or uh, any class? What do I learn about this doctrine as I'm studying? If I'm not learning anything when I study it, you know, if you're giving a thing, a, a, a lesson on tithing, and you say, "Well, it's ten percent. That's it, man." I mean, yeah, yeah, there it is. There it is. You know, we got a whole lot, another hour left. Yeah, <laughs> and you say, "Okay, now what is it about this? Let's dig deeper." And what are you learning when you study it? Until you learn something new, you're not ready to teach. You got to learn something new yourself. How is anybody else as an adult learner going to learn something new if you don't if you're not learning anything? Study until you learn something that grabs you and impresses you and makes you want to change, be better, whatever. And then focus on that and figure out how that can help you get at that doctrine in a way that's going to implant it more deeply into people's hearts. Yeah, that's really helpful. You mentioned something about you know, talking and, and, you know, I think, and I'm sure you're part of some of these discussions of sort of getting away from the lecture style cadence in, in Sunday school and whatnot. And there, there's sometimes this, uh, I call it the tyranny of preparation. Like a teacher spends two weeks maybe preparing for this lesson and they have so much good stuff they want to share and they can't help but, oh, it's suddenly, oh, five minutes left, let's get some discussion. All right. They, they can't help but share it because they prepared so much. Right. And so, but then on the other side, sometimes I feel like we're just, reading a scripture, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? And then, like you said, doctrines don't come to the surface that we can actually consume. So how do we approach that balance between lecture and just talking? Yeah, this is a big question. And people differ in their views about this. And so in Come Follow Me, sometimes in the early going, people would take it too far. And they'd say, well, we're turning it over to the youth to teach. And so I don't have to do anything as a teacher anymore. Mm -hmm. You say, that is not <laughs> the intention. <laughs> that, that you would just stop teaching and not do anything anymore. So, I'll give you an example that I've just been so impressed with. This is our youngest daughter, Lisa. Sometimes it's called the substitute in primary. Mm -hmm. She said, Dad, here is, and she's called on the last minute sometimes. Sometimes the teacher just doesn't show. That, that never so, happens in my world. It never, <laughs> it's never happened. Yeah. And so, she's this kind of go-to substitute teacher. So, she said, here's the thing that works better than anything I've ever tried. She says, I go to the library, I get pictures, and I bring them back, and I ask each student which picture they would like to choose, because they're going to study about that picture and then talk to us about it. And she can do it with young children, older children, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so she does that, and then she says, okay, you got time now, and you'll probably want to refer to a scripture or something, and sometimes the scripture's on the back of the picture or whatever. So you probably want to do that and kind of get in your mind what you want to teach us about that picture. She said, it works every single time. Hmm. She said, they're the best classes I've ever had. And think of her preparation. Now, in many ways, she probably sells herself short about preparation because oh. she's got a lot of preparation inside her that allows her to comment and reflect with the students. Mm -hmm. But she didn't sit down and, and get into, you know, four different books on the subject and then bring a wheelbarrow full of materials to class. Yep, right. And so each student stands up. She says, this is what happens, Dad. At the end, some, it comes to unity. There's some type of unity of doctrine that comes out that they all start to focus around that I didn't know at the beginning they were mm. going to focus around that. It is one of the best examples to me of the lesson is inside the learner. Every kid in there has something that they're thinking about around that picture. When you give them a chance to get that out, then you kind of can then 
see this collective faith starting to build. Elder Bednar start, talks about collective faith. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, now you're kind of, they're all helping each other and prompting each other, adding to each other's comments. This is learning and teaching the gospel sense to me. Yeah. A lot of what we do is not. A lot of what we do is kind of random comments. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's such a, a fine line with that because, like you said, you want that the lesson of the learner to come out and to be shared, right? And so that right. requires some type of dialogue and discussion. Right. And as a le- teacher, maybe, and I, and I remember those mo- moments of, of teaching where somebody says something and you say, that story, that comment reminds me of the doctrine of redemption. Yeah. Wow, I'm going to write that down. You know, And now you're, you're highlighting these doctrines that are coming from the lesson of the learner, right? Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Awesome. Awesome. I once had a... We, when I was mission president, we had a visit from a 70 to our mission. And he went to the board and he just asked, he said, I want to know what you have been learning about missionary work during this past month. And hand would raise and he'd write that on the board. He would then write another one on the board. He filled the board with all of these things, but he organized it kind of in a very interesting way. He kind of coalesced it, collapsed it, combined it, so that when people made a comment, he would kind of figure out like what it related to and how it fit. Mm -hmm. And and so he was creating this incredible diagram of missionary learning that they had been experiencing. After that was all over, the next zone conference, I said, when Elder So-and-so did that on the board, I said, which of those principles did he come up with? He said, none of them. I said, think about that. Do you think he has a lot of knowledge about all of those principles that you came up with? He didn't really come up with any of those, but he drew them out of you and kind of helped you realize what you'd been learning. And before that, you probably didn't realize that these lessons were inside you, but he drew it out in a way. It was beautiful. Yeah. I would love to see it over and over again. Yeah. And I know many people are probably saying, well, brother Oscar Thorpe, people aren't reading the lesson, right? Like they're, right. Not, they're not preparing and so they have right. nothing to say, but it really doesn't necessarily require that to dive into specific doctrines, right? No, it doesn't. Yeah. And no, they hadn't prepared a lesson that day, those missionaries, but they had been performing their duties as a missionary. Yeah. And you learn some things about God, about yourself, about doctrine when you're doing that. And so he said, let me just, he was kind of in a way saying, let me show you how much you have learned. Yeah. That's empowering for a learner. It is empowering for a learner. It wasn't a thing of saying, oh, you got the wrong answer. Oh, (laughs) you, (laughs) you're not giving what I, what I'm thinking of. You're you're not giving the right. (laughs) I have a different way of thinking of it. No, not none of this. Like, I would better always just say, guess what's in my head stuff. Yeah. 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 (laughs) No, no, guess what's in my head. So it's kind of like, I want to know what's in your head and your heart. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful. Really good. All right. And I, I appreciate you entertaining these questions, but I would get so many emails from people saying, you talked with Brother Oscar Lord, but you didn't talk about teaching. You know, come on, Kurt. <laughs> so uh, the last thing, last sort of teaching question I have or, or angle yeah. is, you know, now going on the lecture side, as far as similar to like speaking in general conference, which you've had right. the opportunity where obviously you're not, you're not looking for raised hands or comments uh, from the audience or elsewhere. So what did you learn from teaching or, or teaching and speaking in general conference? So much. You know, there was a counselor in the Relief Society presidency and she said, when you stand at the podium in the conference center, you are in a different realm. <laughs> it's kind of like you leave reality. Yeah. I don't know how you people do it, to be honest. No, no truly. It, 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 no, we didn't know how we do it either. Yeah, exactly. And so here's what I learned. One thing is you have to be open to correction. Because your talk is reviewed, it's eventually reviewed by the Office of the First Presidency. They have some people to review it there and and it gets approved. People say, well, do they give you the topic? No, they don't give you the topic. Mm -hmm. They don't give you the topic at all. You are free to choose the topic. But there are, in a sense, helpers there to help you with the talk and edit it. One of the first talks I ever wrote, someone from Correlation came to me and said, "Uh, Brother Osgothorpe, I... It was the first time we'd ever had interaction. So they didn't know me and I didn't know them. And they said, I hope this isn't offensive to you, but we're kind of thinking you might need to revise your title a little bit. And I said, oh, so you love my talk, except the whole point of it. Is that... (laughs) 
Thanks a you lot. Don't, right? <laughs> you, you don't like the title. That's that's only a minor thing. And uh, no, no, I don't mean that. I said I'm playing with you. I, I said, <laughs> I said I've never written anything in my life that didn't get edited. I've been edited to death. I said that's pr-. He says, well. This is this is our idea that we think might help you. He said you could do this and this and this, and it would really strengthen this talk. I said great ideas. I went right back to the office in the church office building. I sat down, cracked it out, made all those changes, took it back. They said, you've, you've changed this already? <laughs> I, I said, I'd like to get to it. You know, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> and so they looked at it and they said, great. You know, so this is one thing you learn. And some people don't like this. Some people don't like feedback. Some people don't want to be kind of changed, edited, corrected. And so you have to get rid of that notion. You, you yeah. have to, you know, the brother and I always say, seek correction. Uh, Elder Maxwell said, we should thank the Lord every day for those who love us enough to correct us. And you say, yeah, we should, because those people are trying to help us. And so that's certainly one thing I learned. Yeah, um, that's helpful. The other thing I learned is the amazing, and I mean, absolutely amazing support that the other general officers and general authorities are. They are like, I told someone, I said this, being in the organizations, as we now call them, an organization leader, I said, this is like, there are five of them. I said, this is like a basketball team, folks. I yeah, said, that's cool. I said, they are all for helping each other and support. It's like you've got team members, cheerleaders, you've got members of the 12 coming up to you and cheering you on and they you know, give thumbs up as they walk out, look at you in the eye, great talk, kind of just amazing, amazing support. And that's, I think, maybe for me, the most important thing I took from my service. We need to build each other more because mm. the general officers and general authorities of the church are amazing builders of one another. They, Elder Maxwell said, we need to give more deserved specific praise. As a church leader, we need to do that way more, way, way more. If it's telling a deacon how well he did passing the sacrament or a young woman how well she did in her duties as a member of the young women's presidency and of the uh, Laurel's presidency, whatever she's doing, we need to help leaders give more deserve specific praise, be builders, because the general authorities are just incredible builders. Yeah. And so when you give a talk, they build you up. So you can give it. And afterwards, they shower on so much praise. Yeah. It's just marvelous. Because I can imagine, I mean, self-doubt could probably swallow you whole after that experience, right? Oh, you yeah. know, I mean, so. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate all these questions. Uh, and, and I've got plenty of time. So if I, there's no. no there's no hard cutoff here. And I want to get into some of these other topics that yeah, I'm could, excited to, yeah. to explore. But you've... Okay. You recently uh, written and published a book called uh, Filled with His Love, Strengthening Our, Our Attachment to God and Others. Where does the genesis of this book begin? Uh, when did you think, you know, I'll write a book? And you alluded to it that uh, you learn by writing, right? And, yeah. and I, my, that's my, my yeah. experience as well. Well, the verse in Moroni 7 where, where Mormon says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love. All my life, in a sense, I thought, what would it be like to be filled with the Lord's love? What does that mean? We know the verse right before, but charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever, and whoso is found possessed of it, it shall be well with him. So it's a specific kind of love. It's the love of Christ. It's Christ's kind of love. And we're supposed to be filled with that. And I think, well, that I think is maybe the most important thing in mortality. Yeah. I think this is it, you know, because even a verse before that, it says, if you don't have charity, you're nothing. My mother-in-law used to walk right out here and on this little, this is kind of like a stage. Yeah, yeah. If you're sitting in your down, kitchen, there's here. the audience and we're a raised stage here. She used to come out and she would say, wherefore, if ye have not charity, ye are nothing. <laughs> <laughs> My kids would go, whoa. <laughs> Very Shakespearean, huh? Yeah, that's right. She had a little drama in her, you know. And so it's like, what does that mean if you have not charity or nothing? It's kind of like, well, you might have faith, you might have hope, but if you don't have charity, it doesn't matter. You might be rich, you might be well known, you might be talented. 
all kinds of things. But if you don't have charity, it doesn't matter. You're really nothing. Hmm. And so that's the genesis of what gave rise to this book. But then it really came home for me when I was a church leader as a stake president of a young married stake. I told the bishops, I said, please, if there's anyone considering divorce, I want to see them before they get divorced. I, as mm-hmm. a stake president, I would just like to talk to them and see what's going on, what's happening. And so I did. I did that. And I saw a lot of young marrieds. This was usually in the first year or two of marriage. So they were new at it. And some of these things perplexed me. I mean, they, they, some of these relationships were just really difficult to figure out. It's like, why does this young man not get along with this young woman? And what's causing this rift between them? And they could oversimplify and say, oh, it's just communication. We just don't communicate very well. Obviously, it's more than communication. Yeah. It's, there's something going on way deep inside, and I didn't know what it was. But then time went on, and you know, I was a mission president, companionships, How's the companionship going? Well, President, it's not going very well. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Okay, what's going on here between you two? You know, all of this started to say to me, relationships are it. Relationships are the source of our happiness. When you get to the end of life, what do we care about? We don't care about, you know, how much knowledge we gained or, you know, how much money we made or anything. We care about the quality of our relationships. Am I in love with my wife as much as I was before? Is my wife in love with me as much as she was before? Are we loving as a family? Do we love to be together? You know, these things matter way more than anything else. And so I started to look at and say, what causes relationships, you know, to have so much problem? Why why do so many people have so... I was spending as a church leader and it didn't matter what role I was in, it, it seemed. Most of my time was spent helping people improve their relationships or repair them, you know, when they had broken. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, I've got to get into this more. And that's kind of when I started, this was years ago, kind of got acquainted with attachment theory, started reading more about it. And I thought this is helpful Yeah. as for me as a church leader. And even for people who have a break with God and I say, now what happened? You know, someone leaves the church and I say, wait a minute, so do you still believe in God? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. I say, so you're not just leaving the church, you're leaving God as well. Well, I don't want to say it that way, but yeah, kind of. It's like, I don't know if I believe in God. Okay. Mm, Yeah. So their attachment to God got broken along with their attachment to the churches as a member. And so that started to intrigue me. And I wondered if anybody had looked at that from a professional standpoint, from a research standpoint, had they looked at attachment to God as well as attachment to people? And uh, they have a lot. I bet. Wow. There's a lot. I mean, we're talking a great deal of research over the, over mostly the past decade, some 20 years, but most of the past decade, lots of people have been saying, okay, what causes people to leave their roots in religion and detach themselves from God as well. And so with one person one time, I said, he said, well, it's it's the history of the church. That's what's done it for me. And I said, you know, maybe it's more your own history that is causing this rift than the history of the church. Maybe it's not so much what Joseph Smith did. Maybe it's more what happened to you when you were young. Because when you describe to me what happened to you when you were young, I see huge red flags. Yeah. And, and I want to be clear, you're not saying that, that like the problem is not the church, it's you. You're saying like there's a right. deeper wound here in your life, there's maybe a, between you and your father, you and your mother, friends, your bishop as a child, right? The, exactly. Let's look at that first rather let's than- Let's look at that yeah. first rather than start to blame this person or that person. Yeah, or yeah that's some, powerful. Some event. Let's look at what's been your own developmental history as a human being. And when you do that, there are usually some insights that come about. And, you know, I had a missionary one time who I talked, he started talking to me about his younger years. And he said, you know, I resented my mom so much. I said, really? He said, she suffered from clinical depression. She never got out of bed. 
she never did anything. Mm. I basically had to raise myself. I had to do all the dishes. I would look out the window and I would see people playing. I see my friends playing out there, frisbee or whatever, and I couldn't do it. I just developed this yeah. deep resentment. And I think, yeah. okay, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. That, and that's heavy, right? Like that's, This is heavy and yeah. it causes problems and they don't realize it. The person doesn't realize it until they get older and say, wait a minute, why do I have trouble trusting people? Why do I have trouble depending on people? Or even God, right? It, or even trusting God. God. Yeah. Why can't I trust God? Because I couldn't trust my dad. I couldn't trust my mom. They were not there when I needed them to be there. They were not invested in me. And I was talking with a therapist the other day, and he said, one of the things we're finding is neglect can be even worse than abuse sometimes. Mm. It's when someone's close to you and just neglects you and just says, you don't matter to me. I don't really love you. That can be every bit as damaging to somebody as the parent who abuses the person. So yeah. that's why we always put these things together, abuse and neglect, because neglect can be very, very damaging. So. Yeah. Because this person, this child is growing up saying, wait a minute, I thought you were supposed to be my advocate. I thought you were supposed to be helping me and, and you're not. And it's like, yeah. I, you're, you don't really love me. You, you kind of do everything you can to avoid me. So, so then they grow up with deep seated patterns of relationship problems. Yeah. And I want to reflect this back into the context of leadership like you brought up is that it's so easy in these leadership roles where you're connecting with people and they're dealing with all sorts of things. Maybe it is doubt or they begin to question their faith. Maybe they're struggling with uh, you know, immorality, pornography, and we want to sort of default to the behaviors like, oh, well, have you tried doing this more, or doing that less, or increasing those filters or, or whatever it is, but to just sit with them and make, create space and say, tell me about you. And it reminds me, I did an interview with Jay Stringer, who's a Christian therapist and wrote a phenomenal book, but he, he pointed out that when our Father in Heaven went looking for Adam in the garden, he said, where are you? Like to me, that's that's such a powerful position to take as a leader. Just saying, like, where have you been and where are you now? Like, I just want to understand your story, right? Because I remember as a leader, there's sort of this pressure, like, okay, he's coming back in. I've shared those four scriptures that I always share. Like, what am I even going to talk about? But to get, take the pressure off and then just say, like, I just want to understand his story. Where does he come from? What happened this week? What happened as a child, right? And then it empowers that leader so much. Totally. Yeah. And oftentimes the person has a hard time describing it. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm not sure where I am. I'm not sure what's going on. I can't figure it out. My life is all just messed up and I can't figure it out. And you say, okay, so let's talk about, you know, some of what's going on so that we can see if that enlightens both of us about wh where we need to go next. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's really the present that counts. We don't want to focus just on bad experiences that happened as a child. I remember... One member of the 12 one time said, let's remember no one ever had a perfect childhood. So none of us had a perfect childhood, nobody. And so we can't always go back there and say, this is where I got messed up. But for those who are having difficulty with relationships, it's, I think, very essential that we look at what happened with our relationships when we were born and grew up in those, what happened with our siblings, what happened with our parents, so that we can understand now why we are having difficulties with adults. Yeah. You know, this concept of relationship is so powerful. And, and, you know, going back to the earlier discussion about doctrine, like relationship truly is at the core of our doctrine because, you know, obviously Christ is there, but we're encouraged, you know, the temple's near the center and it's, we go to the temple to create covenants or a relationship. And that's been on my mind a lot studying the Old Testament is there's so much covenant talk, right? With Abraham and whatnot. And every time I read covenant, I often just replace that in mind with, relationship. Like God is coming to Abraham and saying, I want a relationship with you. And he's coming to us with the same thing. Right? So this is really totally. at the core of doctrine. It is at the core of doctrine. If you look at the ultimate crowning ordinance in the temple, it is the only ordinance that we covenant together. Yeah, yeah. We make covenants with each other and with the Lord. So we have to do all those other individual covenants before, and that prepares us to do this ultimate crowning ordinance of the sealing power. And so, sealing ordinance. And so, the Lord is trying to say, this is what counts. This is what really matters in life. You know, the quality, not just performing the ordinance, obviously, because people can perform the ordinance and then have a horrible marriage. What counts is the quality of that relationship ongoing. Like right now, 
How do you feel about your wife? How do you feel about your husband? How do you feel about your children? This is what matters. And when those things are good, when I'm very convinced that when people have safe, secure relationships, when they feel whole and happy in their relationships, all kinds of trials can come to them, all kinds of difficulties, and they can withstand them quite well. But when those relationships are frayed and kind of fractured, then we've got trouble on our hands with whatever comes at us. And and things are coming at us all the time in life. But when the relationships are strong and healthy, then we can withstand those things. Yeah. So anything else as far as this concept of attachment theory, you know, in the context of helping, you know, as as a church leader, you know, as people walk in, any other principle or is a way to unpack that more? Well, should I describe just a little bit about what it is? Yeah, yeah. 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 So attachment theory, and I've kind of made this little diagram that helps me. So I've got four little boxes in it. The top left box says is a secure attachment. So this is like with marriage. It says my spouse and I love and cleave to each other. So we are totally into each other. The right-hand box is an anxious attachment. It says, well, I want to love my spouse, but I worry that my spouse doesn't love me enough. And so they're always kind of seeking more more from the spouse. They say, mm-hmm. my spouse is just not giving me what I need my spouse to give me. And if they're not married, then they're saying, ooh, I don't know if that person really likes me or not. He didn't text me yesterday. And that's the first time, oh my gosh, maybe, you know, maybe this is over. Maybe always worrying about the relationship, you know. Mm-hmm. In the bottom left corner is avoidant. So there's this, this is kind of where it says, you know, I just would rather go it on my own. I just find it safer to not have relationships. <laughs> and I don't need to get married. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have kids, et cetera. And we've got a lot of people in our society right now that mm-hmm. are doing this. So no marriage, no kids, very common. The right-hand box is kind of a combination of the anxious and avoidant. So I call it dysfunctional. And it's kind of the toughest box in many ways because you're both anxious and avoidant. So it's kind of like, I want to love my spouse, but I constantly push myself, I constantly push my spouse away from me. Because every time that my spouse gets really close, I worry, I get anxious. So, so I thought I push him away, I avoid it. <laughs> and so you kind of got this approach avoidance thing and you kind of make up your mind how to act. And so it's kind of the worst of both worlds in a sense. The secure one, you know, the, the attachment theory people say, are you, it, does your relationship put you in a safe haven and have, does you have a secure base? The safe haven, I like these terms. The safe haven means I do not worry about anybody hurting me verbally, physically, or any other way. I, mm-hmm. I feel safe in the presence of this other person. And the secure base means I feel empowered. This other person kind of empowers me to reach out and expand myself and do what I need to do because I feel secure. I don't worry about kind of, you know, testing my wings. And... So that's where we want to be in this secure, healthy, enduring relationship. And on the top of the thing I've got, so there's a kind of a positive versus negative self-worth. And so when you have positive self-worth and positive sociability on the other side, then you've got secure. You, uh, thoughts about others are positive and uplifting and thoughts about yourself are positive and uplifting. Then you're secure. When you have positive thoughts about others, but you have no self-worth, then you got anxious style. I really like this person. This person's great. I just, I'm probably not worthy of this person. Mm -hmm. This person's going to reject me. I just worry every second. You know, so that's the anxious person. And the avoidant one says, I do not have positive thoughts about other people. I can't trust them. I don't want to trust them. I've trusted before and I've gotten hurt and I do want to, I don't want to trust anybody. And so I push people away and keep them at a distance. And so that's going to, in the thumbnail yeah, yeah. sketch, a little bit about yeah. attachment theory. So how would you suggest like, uh, as maybe, and maybe you can reflect on personal stories of, of leading individuals as maybe these young married couples would come in considering separating. I mean, yeah. how, how do you use this as a tool or framework to begin to help them? So you can see sometimes if some, it's not very hard <laughs> to see someone that's avoidant 
and doesn't want to trust anybody. And it's not, it's very easy to see the anxious style. Both of these are kind of common now. It's like 20% of the population might have anxious style, 20% avoidant. I mean, and when I watch people interact with each other in relationships, you can kind of see pretty soon, if, particularly if they talk about their problems, you can kind of see what they're dealing with. And when you discover what's happening inside somebody, in other words, if this person comes in and says, I, I'm just so worried that this person doesn't love me and I, I want to love this person, I, I want to, this person, I want this relationship to work out, but I don't think I'm really worthy. I'm such a lousy person. You say, okay, let's work on that. Let's work on your own feeling of self-worth and see what the origin of this is. Let's stop this. You know, you, you can't keep, there's a neuroscience faculty member at Stanford that I really like. And, and uh, she says, you look at all the research on negative and positive self-talk. So sometimes you call it self-compassion and mm. negative self-talk. Most of people's talk to themselves is negative. <laughs> I've noticed this in my own brain. <laughs> in, my, in our own brains, we notice this. It's kind of like, you know, you dumb guy, why did you do that? Yeah. Kind of thing. We're always kind of hammering down on ourselves. This does not help. And so the person with an anxious style does a lot of this. That's got to end. We've got to find a way as a church leader to help that negative self-talk end, stop. And that means they've got to f kind of transform the way they deal with themselves, particularly with other people. And so I love this example she has of, she says, now imagine that, it, I'll put it in the context of the church, mm -hmm. which she doesn't do, but I'll do that. She says, imagine that you've been called to minister to somebody who's dying of terminal cancer and you go see them. And now just think through your mind, how would you respond to this person? What would you say? What would you do? And she says afterwards, I'm pretty confident that you are kind, thoughtful, uplifting to this person, doing everything you could to be a good minister. Now, think about yourself and one of your trials, one of your shortcomings, difficulties, painful things. How do you deal with yourself? Almost all negative. Yeah. You just, you just say, well, it's my fault. Yeah. It's my own fault. That I that, knew better. Right? I knew better. Why didn't I do that? Yeah, and yeah. so you kind of hammer on yourself all this negative stuff. She says, if we could have as much compassion for ourselves as we have, you know, when we're not doing well, when we have a mistake, when we make a mistake, when we have a sin or whatever, we could have as much compassion for ourselves as we do for that person dying of terminal cancer. Oh, things would get a lot better. So as a church leader, I would feel free using such an example and say, look, you're being hard on yourself. You're kind of making things worse by telling yourself how worthless you are. And, and so we've got to end that. We've got to figure out how we can end that. And I would imagine a part of this is that, you know, sometimes uh, an individual will come in and they're struggling with something we don't struggle with and we don't understand why they're struggling with this. And so we try and communicate, well, you know how bad this is, right? Like maybe we don't use those words, but we sort of echo the same thoughts. They're like, oh yeah, I've spent the whole m whole month with my brain that was telling me how bad this is. And thanks for mentioning that, Bishop. You know, like we don't need to say that. We we can walk in knowing that they've beat themselves up enough about this. Like let's, let's, right. th let's focus on attachment, connection, relationship. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And the same thing with the Lord, you know, they yeah. say, I, I don't feel worthy of the Lord's love. That's why I don't feel, I heard someone even the other day, Say, I'm having a hard time feeling the Lord's love. Mm. You say, okay, let's see why this is. <laughs> you know, you don't feel worthy of feeling his love. Well, you came to me as a church leader to help you understand that's wrong. You are worthy to feel his love. Look in the scriptures at how he loved people in the very, you know, you look at the end stage of the Book of Mormon. And all the time, here they are in the worst human behavior that can possibly be imagined. And he's saying, but if you'll just repent, I'm here for you. Yeah, let's do this again, let's, right? Let's, yeah. let's fix this up. And so there's no point of no return. You know, the, the person who comes to church leader and says, I'm, I'm hopeless, I'm beyond help. You know, I've committed this sin so many times, it's, it's beyond. Yeah, I've been new records that- uh, New records yeah. is beyond being <laughs> fixed. It's unfixable. And you say, well, actually, the atonement of Jesus Christ 
is for everyone infinitely. Mm -hmm. That means you're not beyond help. You can receive his help and you can feel his love. They've got to feel his love. And so when they feel his love and when they express love to him, then it seems to me as a leader, that attachment to God is just one of our number one things. It's, it's the first commandment, you know, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, my mind and strength. And, and a person, when they come to a leader, is not feeling that kind of love for the Lord or feeling the Lord's love for them. They're broken, they're frustrated, they're feeling guilty uh, for lots of things or whatever. And we say, okay, we want you to be able to move forward. That means we're going to find a way for you to feel the Lord's love, become reattached to him. I love this image that I never saw it before until I wrote this book, but it says, as a shepherd is attached to his flock. Mm. That's how we want attachment to be. And that attachment is the shepherd is leading, not pushing, not forcing the sheep. Yeah, He's just there to say, I love you. I want you to follow the whole come follow me idea is he's saying, I love you so much. I want you to be with me. And as you said, the covenants, you know, that's why I made covenants with you. Yeah. So that we can be permanently, eternally attached. Yeah. I love that. The, the flock is, or the shepherd's always letting his flock know that he's still there. Yeah. And, and when that, right. that one wanders off, he goes after him and he says, after. I'm still here now. Come back. Right. No neglect. Yeah. There's no neglect ever, ever, ever. And, and when someone grew up with neglect, I think the church leader has to say, let's recognize this as a problem. That neglect that you felt as a young person has affected you. Yeah. And it helps you to feel, it causes you to feel unworthy. It causes you to feel unlovable. A person comes in sometimes and says, I, I'm not lovable. I'm, yeah. I'm such a wreck, you know. And you say, well, actually, you are lovable. Yeah. It makes you think, you know, that story about the young man's mother who, who had uh, depression and, you yeah. know, was neglected him, was in the other room in bed all the time. And it's so natural to project that on to our God, or our Savior, that, you know, oh, he's just in the other room in bed. He doesn't even want to acknowledge me, right? Right. When that's just never, ever the case. And when somebody comes up to you and says, I'm having a hard time feeling God's love, we never think to say, well, Maybe he's run away from you and he's hiding from you. Have you considered like that would not be helpful because that attachment is so core to his relationship with us, right? It is. Yeah. And sometimes the person coming for help does not realize that their earlier life, their younger life affects this. They yeah. just they just have no idea that it does. And you say, let's just recognize that for I had a I had a missionary the very this was the day before we were to depart from our mission after three years as mission leaders. And he said, President, I hate my father. I hate my father. Hmm. And then he went on to describe his father and all the things that had happened when he was a kid. I said, you know, what you're describing is absolutely despicable and disgusting in every way. But you actually cannot go through the rest of your life hating your father. You've got to get rid of this. I have this little chapter called Eliminate Vengeance. Mm. Vengeance is mind says so We can't go through with this heart full of vengeance, no matter how wronged we were. We just can't do it. It eats at us and destroys us. And so we talked with him some more. He needed to find some, I think, some therapy and help when he got home, though, to talk through this more and make sure that he could get over this hate that he had for his father, because that's going to affect his relationships for sure. Yeah. And it's also going to cause him at times to feel unworthy, unlovable, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, that's powerful. And, you know, I love this. What I'm learning here is that, you know, with when considering attachment, like regardless of what the issue is or the topic or the trial or the sin that's coming to you as a church leader, you know, through that individual, it always begins at attachment. Like where, it does. where is the detachment in, right. your, in your relationship with God? Right. Right. Yeah. And so I kind of like, I like to simplify attachment stuff a lot. Yeah. And so I say, do you have a trust problem or do you have a worry, anxiety problem? Do you worry about not being loved or do you just not trust people? And so you keep pushing them away. Yeah. When you start to look at relationships, those two things are going to help you 
understand a lot of problems in relationships. Yeah. This person that says, I don't feel like I can trust anybody because they couldn't trust their parents or whatever. Or the one that says, I worry that I'm not lovable because they weren't loved by the ones that should have loved them. When those things are uppermost in a church leader's mind, then, then they can say, okay, this is understandable. You know, the problems you've got right now are understandable and they are able to be fixed. They are able to be helped with therapy. And so we can get you some help that is yeah. going to help you with this. I, I love this one study. It's so obvious, you know, but I, I love this one study where he says, we did all these couples, and all these uh, relationship problems. And we had both avoidant and anxious styles of attachment styles going on here. And here's what we found. We found that all of these relationship problems could be improved, could be fixed, basically. What was the key? The person's desire. Did they really want to change? Mm. If they really wanted to change, we could say the same thing about repentance. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, repentance can't happen. We say, well, if the person wants to repent badly enough, repentance can happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you've got to have the desire to do it. And so and as a leader, I can't implant that desire. I used to say to missionaries, I say, wow, stand up here and I'll give you a little shot of desire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you don't feel like changing and that's the problem. And so what are we going to do to help you get that desire? And that's a different kind of an issue. And so we have to help them get that. But when people want to change their attachment style, they can change. Yeah. There's yeah. no question about it. Research shows it, but they, they got to want to do it. Yeah. I appreciate that you, you highlight therapy there. And because oftentimes as a church leader, especially as a bishop, I felt like, man, I've met with this person several times. I don't know what to do with them. They don't seem to be changing. I'll send with this therapist. Like, you're the professional. You fix them, right? And there, I'm sort of in this mindset of fixing, right? But it's more of like, okay, we've recognized, I've talked to attachment with this individual. We've clearly recognized there's maybe a detachment from God that uh, they feel. They've talked about their childhood a little bit. There was some attachment issues there. And uh, now, why, why don't we bring a professional therapist in who can really help you explore these things in a way to reattach these things? And then we can begin to reattach to God in a, in a way to help us move forward and, and have that desire to repent and, and know that we can repent, right? In a way it goes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was always a, a heavy referrer. Uh, so, <laughs> as, as we all should be, right? <laughs> to therapists, right? When, when I was a branch president at the MTC a long time ago, I referred a lot of missionaries for therapy. And, and I would then communicate regularly with the therapists. Yeah. And we'd work together so that we could help this young person make the changes necessary to be able to succeed. Yeah. So essential. Yeah. And so when a church leader works with a therapist to help somebody, now you've got this kind of double effort going that I think can lead to tremendous personal growth for people. Yeah. And so many people need it. And they just need to recognize that they need it. And the church leader needs to say, this is not a bad thing to get some therapy. If you had an ACL tear like my granddad, yeah, yeah. then you'd go get surgery. And if you have a tear in your emotional makeup in your brain, you need to get some help yeah. for that. And then things can move forward. Yeah. I love that. You sort of categorize, you know, as far as attachment with attachment with God, attachment with ourselves and then attachment with others. Is any of this linear, like, or maybe it's case by case that you're focusing more on the attachment with God, or maybe you're focusing more on the attachment of with their spouse or others, or does it always start with the attachment from uh, with God and go from there? So here's the way I see it right now. I believe that our attachment to God is the most powerful influence on our attachment to others. In other words, the more we feel His love for us, and the more we express our love to Him the easier it is for us to express our love to others and also forgive ourselves, mm. the love for ourselves. When that attachment to God is weak or confusing for people, and sometimes people are just confused. They, don't, they say, I, I'm just not sure if I feel that close to God. And you say, okay, let's talk about, let's deal with that as a church leader. Let's look at this and see what might be causing that problem and let's see if we can make that better. Because if that gets better, I am very convinced that then, you know, how can you be 
destructive or angry, hurtful, harsh with other people if you feel God's love and you love God. You can't do it. Yeah. It's, and so the, the stories that I heard about couples who were approaching divorce when they were soon after they were married, they had some you know, hateful, harsh things going on. I remember one couple and I said, how's your marriage? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, just tell me about your marriage and your relationship, how yeah. things are going. She said, in what way? What? <laughs> She's just, I said, well, are you happy with each other? She said, well, I don't think we fight more than most people. <laughs> and I said, well, how much do most people fight? And she said, well, everybody fights, you know that. And I said, we don't fight that much. My parents didn't fight. I said, yeah, fighting is not a necessary part of a marriage. And she said, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> and she says, my parents always fought and we, f we fight some, you know, and mm -hmm. I say, well, but it's probably not something you want to be an integral part of your relationship forever. This is in this kind of celestial relationship. Yeah. You probably don't want it in your daily routine, right? Your daily routine. <laughs> what are we going to fight about today? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so this was a little bit of a wake up call for her. And I say, yeah, this is how we need to look at our relationships because if we have this really close, loving relationship with the Lord, we're not going to be fighting and being harsh, you know. I'd yeah. always say, is, is there harshness? Is, you know, sometimes there's harshness. I say, of course there's disagreement. We all have disagreements. That's fine. We talk through disagreements. But if you're being harsh and vindictive with each other, mm, that we don't want. Yeah. That's not what the kind of relationship you want. And I think it does stem from our relationship. That's why the very first commandment, that's why the Lord said everything else hangs on these, you know, everything else. Yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. Any, any, as we wrap up here, any other principle or point that we didn't hit on that you want to make sure we, we include in here or do oh, we I, give I, a good introduction? I think, I think it's a great introduction. Yeah. Awesome. And obviously there's, there's a whole book, right? If people want to really dig in, you've uh, put together the book filled with his love Strengthening our attachment to God and others, and uh, you've. <laughs> it sounds like your your grandkids or kids have uh, told you to start a podcast. That's right. It's like grandpa, everybody's got a podcast. You need one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah my kids said, well, "Dad, this is not a choice. <laughs> you've got to do a podcast." So yeah, we've started a podcast and we're having some fun with it. Nice, and as the same name, filled with His love, and so yeah. wherever they're listening to this podcast, they can hit the the search bar and yeah, and type that in and find it. it. We'll we'll try and link to it as well in the show notes. But great. And uh, any other, uh, this is, it's out. You can get on all major book yeah. distributors and any, whatnot. Anywhere you want to get it. Yeah. I do want to say thanks though to yeah, you, Kurt, sure. for just doing this interview. And this was really an enjoyable conversation. Oh, I hope so. I hope <laughs> so. It was really good. Because I pushed it long. And so I hope it was an enjoyable long. It was very enjoyable. Good, good. Well, last question I have for you. As you reflect back on your time as a leader in the church, how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember a talk by President Hinckley where he said, leadership is lonely. In other words, when you're, in his case, the president of the church, you're the last stop on the block. You know, you are the one. And that can be a little bit lonely at times. And so what you learn as a leader is, to rely on the Lord and rely on other people. You can't have relationship problems and be an effective leader. Think of if, if you're in a bishopric and you don't get along with your counselors. That sends a bigger message to the congregation than anything you say. They can tell if there is a good feeling within the bishopric or the stake presidency or wherever. And they can also sense when you love being together, when you love them. And so being a leader helps you learn that following the Savior means to learn to love like Him. If we learn to love like the Savior loved, then our leadership will be not just effective, it, it'll be enlightening and uplifting and inspiring. And so I think that's what I learned. Remember, to access the Questioning Saints Library for 14 days, visit leadingsaints.org slash 14.
It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness. The loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away, and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.